Do you think that because the ACA has a waiver in 2017, and I almost think that maybe other states will follow suit with Vermont if it's successful? So I'm wondering if maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Well, I think uh, Vermont's effort is uh, interesting and encouraging. Uh, it's still very hard to do this in a single state. I mean, there, there are overflows. For example, a lot of the tertiary care goes across the border to New Hampshire. How will this work out? Uh, but uh, they did, with the help of Bill Shaw at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, pass a law that would have them have a single payer system. As you say, in order to do that, they need a waiver from the ACA, which they can't get until 2017. Uh, they need that waiver because in order to have a true single payer system, you have to capture all of the money that comes into the state from Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, uh, so you have one pot. They have not looked at the financing of it yet. Vermont has the advantage of being very small and not having any big insurance companies in it. And it's not a big biotech state like, like Massachusetts. That gives them a certain, uh, some, some advantages. And we still don't know what the physicians are gonna say about it. Uh, I suspect the primary care uh, physicians, and I've heard that they tend to favor it, but the specialists know. Uh, but everything will depend on the funding. And that's not going to be looked at for another year or so. I heard the governor talk about it just a couple of weeks ago. And, and that's, that's still to be done. But you know, if you could get um, a single payer system in, you couldn't do that in very many states, in Vermont, maybe Maine, maybe Oregon. And it worked reasonably well. I think that would be a very nice precedent. Uh, but it would be more difficult than to do it, say, uh, dropping the age of Medicare a decade at a time, where you had the whole nation in it and you didn't have these border issues. Other questions? Uh, thank you. Um, I was just uh, wondering whether you agree that uh, the Part of the problem is the way in which the issue has been framed, the, uh, the, uh, the sort of phobia associated with the right wing in the United States, uh, anything that might suggest problems with the capitalist model, so that anything that's remotely, that remotely suggests that there's anything, anything weak about capitalism, that capitalism can it, can and in the medical industry does assume predatory forms as profit gouging is the expense of people in the government is uh, you know, that that's the, the that's an issue that's sort of like the third rail or or has been treated as a third rail. Well, I was very interested to hear uh, Dr. Angel so rightly uh, remind us that capitalism <coughs> as a successful market uh, driving requires growth. Um, what I'm describing and what we are working very hard toward is having people spending less time in hospitals. There's been, um, you know, think about the amount of um, construction and um, building of uh, hospital facilities here. I think it is incredibly challenging. And again, I believe there's an opportunity, but I think it's incredibly challenging for those systems to convert to what will be um, more patient-centeredness, more ambulatory care opportunities, fewer inpatient hospital days. Um, I certainly think uh, it's a challenge, but doable, again, based on what patients and consumers are gonna need uh, as we uh, incentivize improved healthcare outcomes, health outcomes. I'd like to comment uh, to, to point out that the right-wing ideology is that the market is the answer to everything, everything. I'm not so sure that the public buys that. I think that in the, um, the, the beginning of Obamacare, there was a public option. Uh, whenever you looked at polls of the public, 
the plurality usually favored some form of single-payer system. It was Congress that said it was, quote, unrealistic, close quote, and Obama. They said, they used that term unrealistic. And what they meant was the lobbyists who called the tune in Washington way too often uh, wanted the health industry to have its way. But if you, if you looked at the public polls, the public was way ahead of the legislators, way ahead. And I don't think they buy the, the right-wing mythology to nearly the same extent that they are claimed to. Wasn't there a, uh, a, a, a something short of a, 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 a public option that, was, that might have been in, incorporated in, 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 uh, the, to supplement the, the private sector? Is it not something between a single payer and uh, a, a not-for-profit uh, plan that would have that diminished the private sector's abilities to extract maximum profits. It was supposed to compete with the private sector. That was the original idea. And uh, it was dropped. The uh, private sector did not like that. Uh, they knew that they could not successfully compete with it. It would be, uh, it would be like Medicare that would compete with the private insurance companies. Uh, Moshe, you, you alluded to this uh, in your discussion about what I think is sort of one of the elephants in the room, which are these powerful health systems that exist now and are actually being furthered by the ACA, right? Because to do the things in the ACA right, you need scale. IT, resources through population management, big data, analytics, you have to have big systems that have big resources. Most of the doctors now are going to be working directly for these big systems. So they lose power, they lose control. We have a big system in this area. <laughs> that is, you know, in part, some of the reasons why healthcare costs are so high, because when there's fewer players, prices go up. How do you see this, this movement or this, this, you know, reality really reversing itself? Because some people would argue it's, it's really going to be difficult to reverse it, and, and that's the key. You've got to be able to uh, address the power, the bargaining power of these big hospital-based systems. Well, I don't know the solution to it unless you did have a completely different system uh, in, in which the healthcare facilities would have to separate their operating costs from their capital costs. Now they don't do that. Um, but I think you put your finger on, on a, a real trend that's happening, which is hospitals buying up large groups of physicians who work for the hospital and for the hospital's bottom line, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and I don't think big is ever good <laughs> in, in medicine, and I certainly don't think that physicians should be working for hospitals. Uh, I'd rather see it the other way, that, that, that physician groups own the hospitals. Time for one last question. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Moore, for the wonderful uh, lecture and the wonderful series. Um, so we've been talking about delivery systems and we've been talking about um, insurance, insurers. But I guess um, the other piece is all of us, the consumers. And so I guess can you talk to us a little bit more about you know, the responsibility that each of us have to take care of our health and to you know, keep talking about prevention and you know, all of these things that there's all these products and things that you're, you're coming up with supposedly to help us uh, have better health. But each have to take responsibility for our health and I guess what are, what are the public health um, movements that are out there that are supposed to help us all um, in, in, in having better health. So there are some wonderful conversations going on in Massachusetts that have um, been innovative and thought, uh, begin, uh, they're beginning to think more creatively than um, just thinking about our interaction with the healthcare system, but in fact are beginning to value things like access to healthy foods, access to livable streets and um, walkable neighborhoods, that there is 
a relationship between our overall health and having access to the medical system and having housing and having our basic human needs met. Um, there are some wonderfully innovative, there's some money now flowing from the state to be able to fund some of these innovative programs. Uh, from an advocacy perspective, there are coalition tables that are being set that um, that talk about not just healthcare policy, but also these other elements that have to do with our overall well-being. I think there is, you know, if you listen or read, there are wonderfully thoughtful things being uh, written about uh, access to uh, healthy food and a value placed on exercise, that it truly requires a holistic approach to keeping us healthy. It is not just being able to go see a, a doc or a primary care provider. And I, I encourage you, often, um, I don't know if anybody here lives in Somerville, but um, Healthy Somerville, uh, Shape, up. Shape Up Somerville, I beg your pardon, is looked to as a national model because again, it is having a holistic approach for driving toward a healthy community. Um, Mass in Motion, I would mention, is one of the programs that Massachusetts pioneered uh, under Commissioner Auerbach's leadership. We um, uh, spent money on valuing uh, helping people to make healthy choices. It's clear that if you make healthier choices easier to make than unhealthy ones, people will um, take advantage of them. And again, it affects people's productivity and overall health and well-being. Great way to end.